thank you, choir. Thank you, Brother Steve. That's a good way to start church this morning. Welcome to church today. We're so glad and grateful for you being here, our faithful church family. Thank you for being in your place. I see our returning guests as well as first-time guests. Also, we want to welcome those who are joining us through our live streaming uh, today. I do want to make note it's good to see Miss Darlene Ramsey and her family uh, with us today. We'll be having uh, Brother Don's uh, homegoing service this afternoon at 2 o'clock here in the auditorium. I hope that you can make it. And uh, it's going to be a wonderful celebration of a great man's life. And um, uh, he's doing okay this morning. He's doing okay uh, this morning. And so uh, we're going to celebrate his life at 2 o'clock. But it is good to see uh, the family here uh, this morning. Shake their hands, hug their necks when we have shake-hand time, if you would. I wanted to read a thank you card. It says, saying thank you seems so small. Thank you for the cards. Thank you for the calls. Thank you for the text. Thank you for the visits, but most of all, thank you for your prayers. I love my church family. That comes from Brother Ronnie Adams. Uh, Brother Ronnie has been uh, suffering with terrible uh, sciatica, and uh, he says, P.S., don't quit praying. How many of you know he has bigger problems than sciatica, all right? So <laughs> keep praying for him, all right? And especially Miss Judy, I uh, pray for her. Brother Mike Matters, where is Brother Mike? Is he not in here? All right, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we love you. We thank you for your great love for us. We thank you for the opportunity to assemble uh, together here this morning and to praise you and to uh, hear a message from your word and to fellowship with one another. We pray everything that is said and done today would honor and glorify you we pray that we would be a blessing to others today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Let's stand as we sing. Sing it out this morning, all right? I know whom I have believed. I know. Sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. I will sing, sing it. I will sing. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord. With my mouth will I be known thy faithfulness, thy faithfulness. With my mouth. Sing. I will 
mercies of the Lord. When I saw the cleansing fountain open wide for all my sin, I obeyed the Spirit's wooing. When He said, Will thou be Sing it now. And I Sing that chorus again. I will praise Him. I will praise Him. Praise the Lamb for sinners slain. Give Him glory, all you people. For His blood can wash away. Amen. Turn around and shake somebody's hand this morning. Tell them you're glad to see Him. Sing it together, sing it out. I will praise him, I will praise him, praise the Lamb for sinners slain. Give him glory, all ye people, for his blood can wash away. Amen. All God's people said, Amen. You may be seated. songs they sing in heaven let the world proclaim oh, what a lovely name Him 
return in clouds of glory saints from every race shall behold his face and with him enter heaven city ever to acclaim oh what a lovely Sing it with us, won't you, if you know it? Oh, what a lovely name, the name of Jesus, reaching higher far than the brightest song. Oh, and it's sweet, sweeter than the song they sing in heaven. more the same Oh, what a lovely name Praise the Lord. Thank you, fellas, for that. That was a blessing. Today we honor Miss Tawana Adams as our church receptionist, church secretary. Uh, she's put up with a lot. In 30 years. Let's honor her. Miss Tawana, come on up here if you would. Do you need help yet? No, no. Make sure you let her know how much you appreciate her. We have a small token of our appreciation for you. And uh, let's, uh, let's give her another round of applause. Thank you, Miss Tawana. She didn't, she didn't want to give a speech, so, uh, but we know she likes to talk. So uh, if you can get with her personally, I'm sure she uh, has a speech to, to tell you. Brother Tony. All right. Well, if you are a teenager or a parent of a teenager and they are going to the youth conference, we need to meet immediately after the morning service in the rooted class just behind here. Uh, we look forward to a great week. We hope you'll be praying for us as we travel this week. Uh, got a long ways to travel and pray for the speakers and pray that um, the truth would be proclaimed and, and, and hearts would be challenged and changed. That's what it's all about. Uh, and today during Kids Church, we want you to understand what, we're, uh, what they'll be learning today. And today we'll be looking at Paul uh, or Saul's conversion to the Apostle Paul. You know, um, he was a pretty self-righteous man before he met Christ, wasn't he? You know, but here we're going to talk about today is Paul's faith in Christ changed his life forever. He exchanged his self-righteousness for Christ's righteousness. Amen. And we hope that our kids understand today that Jesus, when you come face to face with him, he can change your life forever. Amen. But Paul had to repent of his old way of life. And God changed his life forever. And thankfully, we're still learning from the Apostle Paul and, God's, uh, and God using him to communicate his word today. So we're thankful for what God can do in a life of somebody who is actually against the church. God's grace covers a multitude of sins, even the greatest of sinners. That's what we'll be learning about and celebrating God's grace today. Let's pray. Lord, we love you, and we are thankful for you. Thank you so much for dying on the cross for our sins. Lord, we pray that if there's anybody here today that hasn't experienced the grace that comes from your cross, Lord, that we would repent today of our sins. Lord, that we would understand that we are sinners separated from God who is holy. But Lord, you sent your son, Lord, to exchange our self-righteousness for your righteousness. 
Lord, we love you and just pray that you're honored and glorified throughout the remainder of this service in Jesus' name. Amen. If you're three through 11 year old, would you please stand? And if you're visiting with us today and have a, a child during that, uh, in that age group, if you would escort them, follow the Stampede of Children to the back, we have a registration form to, uh, uh, for you to fill out so you'll know exactly where your children are today. Thank you. All right, let's sing while they are leaving for Kids Church. Jesus loves the little children. Jesus loves the little children. All the children of the world. Every child shines up bright, each one precious in his sight. Jesus loves the little children of the world. We pray they have a wonderful day in, in Kids Church today. Let me give you some announcements. These are in your bulletin. Ladies' Wings meeting is tomorrow. Evening at 6.45, there's a sign-up sheet for that. This Thursday is our Salt Fellowship, and uh, we want to invite all of our senior adults and anybody else who has a lunch break between 11.30 and 1 uh, to come and fellowship with us. It's potluck, so that's going to be a good time. Pray for our young people and uh, our leaders. They will be going to youth conference this Friday and coming back on Sunday. And then let's remember our Men of Valor Bible study this Saturday. There's also a lift activity, ladies in fellowship together, uh, on this Saturday at 9.30 as well. On the back of your bulletin, uh, you will find a logo that says, Don't Just Come to Church, Be the Church. And we are inviting those of you who would like to, to get involved in ministries here at our church and so if uh, you read that and there's something there that uh, sparks your interest as far as being a volunteer here in our church, we would sure love you uh, to come and see me, and we'll sign you up and, and put you to work. Also, if there's something on there you see that, that's not on there that our church could benefit from, a volunteer position, then make that uh, noticeable to us as well. With that being said, I want to say thank you for your generosity and your faithfulness and support of our church and our missionaries financially. I want to encourage you to continue to be faithful. And uh, let, me, let me say this. The reason we give is because God has blessed us. And uh, he certainly has been good to us and has blessed us. So I want to encourage you to continue to be faithful uh, to give. Now, in a couple of weeks, we're going to have our 74th anniversary of Parkview Baptist Church. Uh, the last year or so, it's, uh, it's been tough. It has been tough. We have fought some battles, and, uh, and we don't want, listen to me, church family, we don't want that to ruin this opportunity for us to come together Saturday night and all day Sunday and celebrate God's faithfulness, His mercy, His grace, His blessings upon Parkview Baptist Church for 74 years. Amen. We, don't, we want to take advantage to give God praise as a church together. And so we're going to start off on Saturday night, April the 27th at 5 o'clock. Ladies, empty out your refrigerator. Whatever's in there, bring it, okay? And we've got somebody here at our church that'll eat it, okay? <laughs> and we're going to have a potluck uh, fellowship. Our guest speaker is Pastor Russell Riggs from San Antonio from the Town East Baptist Church. You will thoroughly be blessed by his preaching and teaching. And uh, he'll be speaking that night. And then all day Sunday, 9 o'clock hour, won't have any Sunday school classes. We'll all be in here just like we are today, 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock, and 5 o'clock as we celebrate uh, God's faithfulness to Parkview Baptist Church. And God has been faithful. 74 years. And uh, we praise the Lord uh, for that so very much. All right, let's sing Holy, Holy, Holy. Miss Renee, you come. He deserves our praise because he is holy. Sing it out together.
lift it up on the last now, sing it. Holy, holy, holy Lord God Almighty, all the world shall praise thy name in earth and sky and sea. Holy, 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 merciful. Not only is God holy, he is thrice holy. Holy, holy, holy. Brother Ken, you come. Amen, right, church? Amen. I like that. Mighty and merciful. That's not something man is, both mighty and merciful. But we serve a mighty, merciful God. I have asked uh, Brother Jake Swim to come pray. Now, that's right, Jake. Come on up here. <laughs> I tell you what, uh, we love Liz, Drake, and Addie. And uh, a while ago when it said about being the church, this guy and his family, that they just don't come to church. They are the church. Amen. What a servant. And, man, I tell you what, I love serving alongside this guy. We have the best time. You ought to come check it out, how much fun serving the Lord can be with us too, because we have fun. Love you, Brother Jake. Pray for us. All right, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for being holy. Thank you for your love, God, to us. Thank you for your mercy and your grace in, in my life, Lord, and so many here. Lord, thank you for being just a good God. Lord, I pray, God, that you bless the service this morning. Bless Pastor Joey preaches, Lord, help our hearts and minds to be open and help us to want to be different as we go out today. Lord, thank you again for saving us and um, just taking care of all of our needs and Lord, blessing us beyond what anything we can ever um, ask or think, Lord. And God, I just, um, Lord, uh, bless the service, bless the children as they're in their services. Pray, God, that you'd work in their hearts and if anybody in this service does not know you as their personal Lord and Savior, please draw them to yourself and save them today, Lord. We thank you for again for just being our Lord and Savior. In Jesus' name, amen. The sky shall unfold, preparing his entrance. The star shall applaud him with the I praise the sweet light in his eyes shall enhance those awaiting and we shall Behold him, then face to face, and we shall be. Yes, we shall 
your fire your woods wet matter of fact I the Lord has directed my heart and to uh, study on the rapture of the church beginning tonight you know I don't believe Jesus is coming soon I believe he's coming quickly 2,000 years now, we've been waiting for his return. So that ought to tell you he's not coming soon. His coming is imminent. It could happen any moment. And tonight, I'll, I'll, I'll share with you the difference between coming quickly and coming soon. When he comes, you won't have time to get ready. So you have to get ready, stay ready, and be ready. 
because he could come at any moment. And that's how he wants us to live. And we often forget that. And so looking forward uh, to that. But I'm really looking forward to this morning. 1 Corinthians, if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn there. To chapter number 2, we're going to look at, in detail at uh, verses 1 through 5 this morning. Last week, we looked at one phrase uh, in verse number 1 where the Bible says, When I came to you, speaking of Paul's coming into Corinth to minister the gospel, he went to the Jew first and then to the Greek. The Jews rejected it. And so he spent his 18 months there uh, with the Gentiles. And uh, we're going to look at verses 1 through 5 in, in context this morning about him coming in and um, the things he had to say about uh, his ministry. Okay, In this section, Paul is speaking about his ministry among those in the Corinthian area. Um, verse number one, And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. The purpose of this speaking of his ministry, how he taught and how he preached, is to emphasize what he spoke about in the previous chapter. Namely, that his ministry was not, get this, of the wisdom and power of man. It wasn't in his eloquence, it wasn't in his giftedness, it wasn't in his ability, it wasn't in his talent, but Paul's ministry, and can I say this, every biblical ministry there ever has been is always in the wisdom and power of God. <laughs> Did you hear that? It's not in the wisdom and power of man. It's in the wisdom and power of God. And so Paul con uh, conducted his ministry of preaching and teaching, <coughs> could I say, different than many men do in our day and time. Matter of fact, Paul's way of doing ministry in the wisdom and power of God was radically, everybody say radically, it was radically different from how the world and worldly men do church ministry. Can I tell you that our standard for church ministry here at Parkview Baptist Church is not some other church? Here at Parkview Baptist Church, we never want to lose our identity of being a biblical New Testament local church. It is so sad. Can I say that again? It is so sad to see biblical churches starting to adopt what worldly churches are doing in order to get a crowd. And before long, they are worldly and they have lost their identity of being a biblical church. Our standard is the Word of God especially the church epistles and the pastoral epistles. You say, what are those? First and second Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, first and second Thessalonians, first and second Timothy, Titus, and then Revelation chapter two and chapter three. Here at Parkview Baptist Church, on Sunday mornings, you will get a healthy diet of those books of the Bible that I just mentioned. Because those books of the Bible are our biblical mandate, our biblical pattern on how to do church ministry. 
Church ministry based on the biblical model of church ministry is always going to be different. Can I say that? It's always going to be different, and I mean radically different, by, by the way the world does church. How many of you know the world does church? Someone has said that the world has gotten so churchy and the church has gotten so worldly that you can't hardly tell them apart. That, that should not be so. Could I get some guys to help me real quick, Brother Chris and Brother Steve and Brother Ken? I already had them picked out. I had visions and dreams about y'all last night. <laughs> One of you stand over here, far away. You've seen this illustration before. We're going to pretend, this is just pretending, okay, that Brother Chris is, is God, okay? Uh-oh. Uh-oh. We're going to pretend that Brother Steve is the church, and we're going to pretend that uh, Brother Ken is the world. Yeah. Woo! <laughs> the world, the Bible tells us, is waxing worse and worse. The world is not getting closer to God. Matter of fact, the world's getting farther from God. Go on. (laughs) And can I tell you, the modern American church is getting farther away from God too. And here's their justification of doing so. They're staying separate from the world. Now, stop. They're not all the way over there. But if the world is always moving and God is stationary, and let me say something about separation, all right? In independent Baptist churches, a lot of time people take that as being mean and nasty and unkind, and a lot of of churches, they're that way. That's their spirit. They have a holier-than-thou attitude. Uh, That's not biblical separation. Biblical separation is we're in this world, but we're not of this world. And biblical separation is as a believer individually and as a church, we are to draw close to him, to the Lord. And so we should be getting closer to him, which automatically, biblically creates a distance between us and the world. We ought not stay the same distance away from the world and get farther away from God, right? right. Right? And that's the type of ministry that Paul is dealing with or he's speaking about that he's not, he doesn't have any part of. And so as the world gets farther away, (laughs) go away, yeah, you can go down, okay. And the church moves as well, you can see what is happening. And this is where a lot of churches and a lot of Christians are. Instead of getting closer to the Lord, instead of every day with Jesus is sweeter than the day before and we're walking toward the Lord, we, uh, we like to ride the fence but the fence keeps moving. And where the world used to be, now the church is there and and so on. Okay, thank you, fellas, for your help there. Now, I've got a couple of soap boxes, and I I want to bring one up right now. That illustration, which is exactly what the Bible teaches, proves to us that the condition of the world is not the report card for the church. I get so mad when I hear somebody say, well, if the church would do better, the world would get better. Listen to me, ladies and gentlemen. The church, we could do better. We could do better. But how many of you know the world is not going to get better. You know what that thinking is? It's actually a theology. It's called Kingdom Now Theology. 
in that theology, you can look it up if you want to or talk to one of us about it. That is false teaching. That's false teaching. And I hope you know that not every church is a biblical church. <laughs> Just because they have a steeple on top of the building or a cross on the building does not mean that they're biblical. I hope that you know that not every man behind a pulpit is God called or even saved. I hope you know that there is a lot of worldly churches and worldly men leading those churches. I hope you know that there is a lot of psychology being propagated in those churches. Well, Brother Joy, look how big their church is. That leads me to something else. I hope you know that dead things swell. You ever gone by roadkill when it's fresh? But then the next time it's bigger? The next time it's bigger? And the next time it's bigger, it's rotten on the inside. Just because it's getting bigger doesn't mean it's biblical. Now that's not an excuse for our church not growing. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is dead things swell. Have no life in them. Have you ever read about the end time church after the true church is raptured? Matter of fact, it's worldwide. That's going to be pretty big. And the false prophet, you can read about him in Revelation, he's the, the pastor of that church. What does that tell us? Bigger is not always biblical. Here's the best way I found to define the church. It's those of us who have believed the gospel. And upon believing the gospel, we've been called out of the world by the Holy Spirit and baptized by the Holy Spirit into the body of Christ. That's why there's in the universal church or the church at large, the body of Christ, there is no unsaved people there. It's all saved people who have been called out of the world and placed into Christ's body. There's no saved people there. Now, there unsaved people there. There's unsaved people probably among us today because in the local church, you can come to a local church and be unsaved. But you can't be part of the true church, the body of Christ, the universal church, and not be saved. Everybody understand that? That's what happens when, when you believe the gospel and God saves you, he baptizes you into the body of Christ. He calls you. The church, definition of church is what? Called out assembly. Called out of what? The world. We've been called out of the world, therefore we should not be worldly minded or love the world or be of this world. Believers, how many of you know this? We are to love God and each other. We're not to love the world and possessions. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. For all that is in the world is the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. And here's what Jesus or John said under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Whoever loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. The world. There's three ways the word world is used in our Bible. You have the cosmos, the earth, the world. Then you have the world system. Very wicked, very deceptive, very evil. And then you have society without God. That's found in John 3.16. For God so loved society without God that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Can I say it this way? The church has no place in the world, and the world has no place in the church. The church is on this cosmos. 
But the world system shouldn't be our operating system in our church. And our church is made up of believers, not society without God. So all of this is the opposite of the wisdom and power of God. All that we've just talked about stems from, is a result of the wisdom and power of man. Do you know man doing his own thing, left to himself, will self-destruct? We know that, right? And so that's what the difference is between the wisdom and power of God and the wisdom and power of man. It's man leaning to his own understanding and how he thinks church ministry should go instead of following the true and proven guidelines God has given to us in his word. Man thinks he's smarter than God and that God's way of doing things are outdated. Fooey on that. Can I tell you, reading the Bible is like reading this morning's headlines. The most relevant book in all the world is the Bible. Notice in verse number one, he said, I came to you not with excellency of speech. Paul was not a great orator. He did not have rhetorical skills by which he could persuade people to make decisions that were not eternal or lasting. Rhetoric or rhetorical is the art of effective or persuasive speaking. Can I tell you, there's a lot of men in pulpits who rely upon rhetoric. They're not relying upon the power and wisdom of God. Help me out. Paul did not have that, but can I tell you, it did not discredit his message. (laughs) He spoke plainly and humbly, and he let the Holy Spirit do the persuading. He didn't use his eloquence and his words to persuade people. Do you know when I talk to you, I'm talking from here to your head. But you know how the Holy Spirit talks to us. Right here. This does not mean, notice uh, also in 1 Corinthians 2, 1, not with excellency of wisdom. This does not mean Paul's message was unintelligent or impractical, but rather that as he did not wow the people with his speech, neither did he wow the people with his intellectual cleverness. He did not try to impress them with his skills or his scholarship or his schooling. Notice what else he says in verse 1, declaring unto you. This is in reference to what he declared to them was the gospel, was the testimony of God. Here the testimony of God refers to the gospel and also the scriptures in general. And so that's what a pastor is to do. The pastor is to declare what God says, not what he thinks as the pastor, right? What what the Bible says, period, is what changes lives. Not what the pastor says about what the Bible says. Now, wouldn't it be great if we could come and me just read you the Bible for 30 to 40 minutes? There would be three of us here. And one of them wouldn't be my wife. <laughs> but we've, we've grown so accustomed that we have so little scripture in our messages, in our Sunday school, in our Bible study, and we have a whole lot of what man says about God's word instead of just what God's word says. Amen. Amen. You know know what the parameters 
of our preaching and teaching is? Notice 1 Peter chapter 4.11. If any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. Amen. As the oracles of God. That's our boundaries. We're not to go outside this. 1 Corinthians 2.2, 2, as we continue on. For I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And so... Here he starts talking about his motive in his ministry to these people. He gives us a bit of insight into some of his motive in his ministry in Corinth. Notice the word there, determine. That word does not mean, uh, it actually means to decide. It does not mean effort, determination. It means to make a decision. Paul had decided before he ever came to Corinth that his ministry would be singular in nature. Not to know anything among you, this does not mean Paul would refrain from being a busybody. How many of you know preachers are nosy? Right, they like to know your business. <laughs> That's not what that means, to know nothing among you. But the only thing he needs to know for his ministry to be effective in Corinth is the Scriptures. Amen. A pastor doesn't need to be nosy and know everybody's business to be effective in his preaching and teaching. There are some preachers who think that that makes them relevant. But can I tell you, as I said a while ago, this is the most relevant thing in all the world. Amen. That's why we teach verse by verse and doctrine by doctrine and we let God's Word get into your business. That's a lot safer for me. If God gets in your business instead of me. And how many of you know this book knows what your business is before we ever get started, right? Hebrews 4.12, For the Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and the marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. As the Bible is, as you are reading the Bible, the Bible is reading you. Yeah. It knows, it knows the thoughts and intents of our hearts. That's why we're safe just preaching the Bible, just teaching the Bible, just telling people what the Bible says. Because you can fool the preacher. That's why I don't call you before when I come see you. I, I, want, I, I want the cigarettes out, I want the beer, I, you know, I want you, I want you to be you when I come see you. And hey, I do have a sneaking suspicion when I ring the doorbell and it takes you 10 minutes to get there. All right? <laughs> Notice, notice what he did. He, oh, we got to go back to verse number two. He preached Christ crucified. You know, we can, we can preach Christ as an example, as a teacher, as a miracle worker, and all these things, but the emphasis of Paul was on the cross. And the emphasis of Paul's ministry there in Corinth was Christ crucified. And notice what he says in verse 3. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. Do you know what that phrase tells us right now? It tells us that Paul's ministry was of God, not of human nature. I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. The character of Paul's Living in Corinth showed the need of divine power to allow him and, and give him strength to minister. As Paul later said, not that we are sufficient of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of God. Do you know and understand what we're talking about today? Paul's ministry depended upon God and not himself. No pastor can serve God and his people well without the wisdom and power of God. 
Now, he can get the job done with the wisdom and power of man, but he can't be a biblical pastor without the power and wisdom of God in his ministry. Verse 4, Paul said, In my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power. Again, Paul did not uh, rely upon his talent, upon his ability, but he relied upon the power of the Holy Spirit. Can I tell you there's nothing wrong with being grammatically correct when you are presenting the gospel or you are preaching the word of God? But can I tell you, we need more than grammatical correctness in our preaching and teaching if we're going to be effective. We need the wisdom and power of God. Amen. And then we come to verse number five. Why is that? Why did he not rely upon his abilities, but upon the wisdom and power of God? Here's the reason. That your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Amen. Do you know why so many of us through the years keep making the same decisions over and over and over and over? Because decisions based on the wisdom of men are only temporal. But how many of you know whatever God does, He does forever? When he saved us, he saved us not for just a little while. It's forever. And when God, when, when ministry and the teaching and preaching of God's word is done, relying upon the power of God and the wisdom of God, decisions that are made will be lasting. Not only will they be life-changing, but they will be lasting. What's he saying here? He said he would not coerce anyone into saying a prayer or receiving Christ as their Savior. That's not what his job is. He would not use any of the popular high-pressured salesman-type methods of our day and time in pressuring people or persuading people to get saved. He relied upon the power of the Holy Spirit to take the message of God and bring about true Conviction and conversion. Amen, Brother Joey. Amen. This is far different than what a lot of people do. And so let me summarize our text just by saying this. Paul emphasized that when he first came to Corinth, he himself was not that impressive. He said that up front. Not only were his presentations marked by weakness, fear, and trembling, Paul also made a choice not to try to impress the people with his own vast knowledge or skill with words. Instead, you know what Paul did? He presented the truth about Jesus as clearly and simply as he could. This would, been, this would have been a major contrast to the entertainers in his era. How many of you know entertainers are not new? They, they've been around for a long time. In addition, God accompanied Paul's teaching with a demonstration of his power and his spirit. The advantage of this, Paul now writes, is that those people's faith rest on God's power and not on Paul's persuasiveness with words of human wisdom. I do not, and neither do you, want to stand before God one day having persuaded or pressured somebody into saying a prayer, giving them a false profession, a false assurance because it's in human wisdom and not in the power of God, I would hate to stand before God knowing that that's what I did and that person busted hell wide open when they died. How awkward is this? How awkward is this? Have you ever 
led someone to the Lord and you're talking with them and somebody else later and they'll tell the person you're talking with, Joey led me to the Lord or Steve saved me. That's awkward, isn't it? Because that's not how it's supposed to be. The man that led me to the Lord did it the right way. I'm sure the person who led you to the Lord did it the right way because you got saved. How wonderful is that? You know how they do it? They present the gospel. They teach you what the Bible says. And then they allow the Holy Spirit to do the applying. They allow the Holy Spirit to do His work. Do you know how we know the, the Bible is true? Do you know how we know the Bible is true? We know the Bible is true because you don't need to add man's charisma, his wisdom, his tear-jerking stories, his eloquence for the Bible to make eternal changes in your life. You don't need any of that stuff. That's how we know the Bible is true. Unless, unless you come to church or come to Sunday school or come to a revival meeting or come to a conference to hear a man preach and teach instead of hearing from God's Word. You still with me? Do we love the Bible as we should? The test is how much time do we spend reading and studying it? Some Believers spend more time in the daily bread than they do in their Bible. They spend more time in devotional books than the Bible themselves. I'm not saying daily bread and devotionals are wrong. I'm saying if you spend more time in those things than the Bible, that's wrong. Amen, Brother Joey. Well, let me close by reading you a passage of Scripture out of Nehemiah 8. And all the people gathered themselves together as one man into the street that was before the water gate. This is in Nehemiah chapter 8. So they all came together as one. They're unified. They're there in unity. And they spake unto Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses. In other words, Ezra didn't show up and tried to get a crowd. The crowd assembled and they tried to get Ezra to bring the book. I think they, they had a love for the law. And they spake unto Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had commanded Israel. And Ezra the priest brought the law before the congregation, both of men and women and all that could hear with understanding upon the first day of the seventh month. Now here's where it gets... It gets fun. And he read therein before the street that was before the water gate from the morning to midday. He didn't, he didn't do expository preaching. He just read the Bible for three or four hours. <laughs> and listen to this. And he read therein before the street that was before the water gate from the morning until midday before the men and the women and those that could understand in the ears of all the people that were attentive unto the book of the law. You know why they were able to stand there? We're going to see in a minute they stood the whole time because they were attentive. It's one thing to be attentive to what man is saying. It's another thing to be attentive to what God is saying. I thought this would be good. I really did. Last night when I was putting this down, I thought, man, they're going to be shouting me out. <laughs> and Ezra the scribe stood up on a pulpit of wood. That's where this comes from. Which they had made for the purpose. And beside him, he had a staff of men that stood up there as well. He opened the book in the sight of all the people and when he opened it, the people stood up. And he read for three hours. And you know what those men did? Those men then went out into that crowd individually 
explaining to those people what he read. So they weren't just standing up. They weren't in an amphitheater. They were in the street. So they stood for three or four hours listening to him read, and then they stood forever, I don't know how much longer, to let these men come and explain to them what was read. I think they had a desire for God's Word. And the Bible says that they read distinctly and gave the sense and caused the people to understand the reading. Let me just say this and I'm through. When studying the Bible, when teaching the Bible, the power comes from the Holy Spirit illuminating our minds and revealing to us what the Bible says. Here at Parkview, we want to teach the Bible in a plain way, just telling you what the Bible says. We want to teach the Bible as it is to people as they are. We don't want to use the Bible as a billy club beating people over the head. We just simply want to tell you, hey, here's, here's what it says. And let the Holy Spirit illuminate that to your mind and reveal to you what the Bible is teaching. We want the Holy Spirit to be able to apply the Bible without man interfering. Amen? Amen. Ms. Marilyn, would you please come and help me? If you know you're saved and you're not ashamed of it, would you raise your hand real high? Wave it to me, all right? Maybe you're here this morning and you have questions about being saved. It's the most important decision you will ever make in your life. And can I say this? It's your choice. God didn't choose some of these people over here to be saved and some here and if... He didn't choose you too bad. No, that's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches that all of us have a choice to be saved. If God is speaking to your heart and revealing to you that you need to be saved, I wish that you would come and let us take the Bible and show you how to be saved. Maybe you're here this morning and you have a heavy heart. Well, in this time that we live, in this world that we live in, there's a lot of heartaches, isn't there? And this is a good time just to come and pray with one of your brothers in Christ or one of your sisters in Christ. And y'all just pray together. Maybe you need to do that this morning. As we sing, here am I, Lord, send me. Let's stand together.